Okay, so this video is part two of Investments and Associates. So this one deals with inter-entity transactions for accounting for associates. So before I get into that, I've just got a correction from the last video. Okay, so in the last video, in the calculation of share of equity from the current period, there's a transfer to the general reserve of $5,000, which I made to an adjustment to the share of our equity for. But that is wrong. Okay, no adjustment should be made to the share of equity for transfers to the general reserve in the current period. Okay, so I should not have made an adjustment there, but I did. So if there's a transfer to the general reserve in the current period, no adjustment should be made. The reason for that is because when we're calculating our current period share of equity, we use our profit number. We can see it was $62,000. So we would have increased our share of equity by that $62,000. Now, when we transferred that $5,000 to the general reserve, we were taking it out of that $62,000 profit that we had already recognized. So we'd moved it from the profit account to the general reserve, which would have taken the profit account to $57,000 and the general reserve account to $5,000. So, those two accounts would add up to give the total amount of equity that we're actually entitled to in the current period. But because we recognized our share of equity using the original profit number of $62,000, the transfer to the general reserve has already been accounted for in our original $62,000 recognition. So, we should not make adjustments for our share of equity in the current period if there's a transfer to the general reserve. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into part two for the inter-entity transaction, so I apologize for that correction. Okay, so equity accounting for inter-entity transactions. So we need to make adjustments if they're upstream or downstream transactions. So I've got one of each in the example, so I'll explain why the reasons behind them in those examples. Now it's done on an after-tax basis, so adjustments to our share of equity should be done on after-tax, just like part one. And so we only eliminate based on ownership percentage, which again is exactly the same as part one. So straight into our example here, Degas Limited acquired 25% of Rareco for $260,000 on 1 July 2015. So Rareco's equity is comprised of these three accounts here. So we know at 30 June 2017, Degas Limited held inventory acquired from Rareco, who made $10,000 profit on the sale. On 1 July 2016, Degas Limited sold equipment to Rareco for $100,000. The carrying value was $50,000 at the time, and the remaining useful life is five years. So Rareco had $100,000 of profit during the 2018 year, and opening retained earnings at 1 July 2017 was $800,000. Okay. Sorry, one too many. So we're going to do our acquisition analysis. When we go and do our acquisition analysis, we come up with goodwill. Okay, so that means no special treatment required. We don't have to calculate any amount in our share of equity. We know if it was a bargain purchase, though, we would need to consider our amount of bargain purchase as our share of or as a part of our share of equity in the period of acquisition, but we know it's goodwill, so we don't need to make any adjustments for that. Okay, so now we need to look at our prior period share, so that is only if the investor is a parent. So we know our movement in retained earnings, I'll just go through this quickly. We know at the date of acquisition it was $765,000, and we have opening retained earnings at 1 July 2017, which is the beginning of the current period, which is also the end of the prior period, was $800,000. So we know that our retained earnings has increased by $35,000, and so we should share in that increase in equity. Now the next one, we have this unrealized profit or inventory. So if we look at our question, we can see that at 30 June 2017, Deggers Limited held inventory acquired from Rareco, who made $10,000 profit on the sale. So, because this, this additional information says at 30 June 2017, Degas Limited held the inventory, 
we know that the transaction must have occurred in the prior period and we know in this transaction Rareco would have sold the inventory to Deggers Limited at $10,000 above its original cost. Now because this is an inter-entity transaction, okay, we need to reverse any unrealized profit. So from the perspective of the investor, we want to use the original cost, which was, let's say, just for example, Rareco had an original cost of $90,000. They've sold it for $100,000 to Deggers Limited, so they've made that $10,000 unrealized profit. But from our perspective here as the investor, it's just a, uh, a transfer of the inventory from one entity to another. And so that profit hasn't actually been made because there's no real actual sale. So Rareco would have recognized that $10,000 profit in their financial statements because they sold it for a $10,000 gain. And so they would have paid tax on that gain. Okay, so we get the $10,000 by 0.7 gives us an after tax amount of $7,000. And so we want to reduce our share in the equity of our associate because they have made $10,000 profit by selling something to us that we believe should not be recognized because we're going to use the original cost of the inventory before Rareco sold it to us. Okay, we just believe it's a transfer of inventory from one entity to the other, so we shouldn't be recognizing any profit. There's no actual sale. So they recognize, Rareco would have recognized it in their profits. And so we want to reduce our share of those profits by that $7,000. Next one, our unrealized profit for equipment. We go back and look at this. On 1 July 2016, Deggers Limited sold equipment to Rareco for $100,000. The carrying value was $50,000 at the time, and the remaining useful life is five years. So we know that from our perspectives as the investor, this equipment is worth $50,000. Now, we sell it to Rareco for $100,000. So, Rareco, when they recognize that asset, they will recognize it of having a value of $100,000 to them. But from our perspective as in the investor, that piece of equipment is only worth $50,000. So, Rareco has recognized $50,000 too much equity from our perspective as the investor. And so, when we are calculating our share of prior period equity, we will want to reduce Rareco's equity by $35,000, because that is the after-tax amount of $50,000 by 0.7. Okay, because we believe, as I've said, Rareco should only have, well, we believe Rareco only has an asset worth $50,000. They've recognized it as it being worth $100,000. So that means they have $50,000 more equity in their financial statements than we believe they should have. So we're making that adjustment to reduce the amount of equity that we can share in down to the amount that we believe that equipment is worth. Now, depreciation adjustment for equipment. Equipment. Again, this is a similar uh, concept, right? If we go back to our question, we know that the remaining useful life is five years at the date of transfer. So, now from our perspective, we know that that equipment is worth $50,000. So with the five years remaining, we'll be depreciating it at $10,000 per year. Okay, that's what we want from the investor's perspective. But Rareco will have recognized it at $100,000 per year. With five years remaining, they'll depreciate at $20,000 per year. So we know that because Rareco is depreciated at $20,000, but from our perspective, we only want to depreciate at $10,000, that Rareco, our associate, will be depreciating at $10,000 too much every year. 
So they'll be recognizing $10,000 more expenses every year. So they'll be reducing the equity by $10,000 extra every year. Okay. And when we take the after tax amount, so we take the $10,000 multiplied by 0.7, okay, we get to $7,000. And now this is actually in the wrong column. Okay. So because we are believing that RECO is reducing the equity by too much every year, we will then increase our share of equity because we believe we should only be recording $10,000 of expenses per year, but they're recording $20,000 of expenses every year. So we believe we should have $10,000 more profit every year. Now, after we'd pay our 30% tax on that, we get a $7,000 net increase in equity. And so we believe we should be sharing in that amount. Now, whichever stupid person designed this question, which was actually me, they got the total share to be $0. So aren't I stupid? But anyway, um, that doesn't really matter. So when we take the 25% share of zero, obviously we get zero. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so now we're going to go through our current period share of equity. So we do this regardless if the investor is parent or non-parent. So our first thing, profit of one hundred thousand dollars. We can see straight back from the question that Reco, our associate, had that one hundred thousand dollars of profit during the two thousand eighteen year. So we should share in that profit. Simple as that. Next, our realized profit inventory. So we know we looked at it in our last calculations that we had an unrealized profit, uh, $10,000 from this inventory into entity sale. But we know in the current year or the year after the inter entity transaction, the inventory will be sold externally. And so because the inventory is now sold externally, we're allowed to realize our profit on that inventory. Okay, so in this subject, we just assume the next year, the inventory will be sold externally unless it's otherwise stated. Okay, so that's how we're realizing our $7,000 of profit because we're now allowed to recognize that the $10,000 of profit, and then we take the after-tax amount, which gets us down to $7,000, we should share in that profit recognition. And then again, our depreciation adjustment of $7,000, exactly the same as what we calculated for our prior period share, because we know our associates depreciating at $20,000 a year, we want to depreciate at $10,000 a year, so we will be reducing our expenses by $10,000 per year. After tax, that comes to $7,000 per year. And so because we want to recognize less expenses, we'll have more profit to share in. And so that's why we're increasing our share of equity for our depreciation adjustment. Okay, so now we go on to our equity journals. So relatively straightforward. We've been through these in the, in the last video, but if the investor's a parent, Right, we'll be recognizing our share of equity in the prior period. Because it's the prior period, our profits will be closed to retained earnings. So that's why we're making the adjustment to the retained earnings opening balance. And we're debiting our investment in associates to reflect our increase in share of equity. But as we know, I'm silly and I made the total share zero for some reason. Um, so that's why we're debiting it by zero dollars. And then Again, we're recognizing our current period share of equity. So when we did our calculations here, we saw that we're entitled to $28,500 worth of equity because when we total all these increases up, it came to $114,000. We multiplied that by a 25% share, we got $28,500 increase in equity we're entitled to. So we credit our share of profits by 28,500 and we debit our investment in associates by that same amount to recognize the fact that we're entitled to more equity. And we know if our investor is not a parent, we only need to worry about the current period. So we're only doing our current period journal entry, not our one for the prior period. One last thing quickly to do is recognizing losses. So we do recognize our share of losses, but only up until the point where the investment asset equals zero. So if our investment asset's worth $100, we 
make a loss of $200. We don't reduce it by $200 to negative 100. We just take our investment asset to zero. Okay. Also, we can offset our losses against other investments in the associate. So if we have, you know, our investment asset, but let's say we also have you know, some other asset which relates to that associate, okay, some other investment or asset such as a receivable, we can offset our losses against that receivable, not only against our investment account. So our final thing, if our associate begins making a profit after a period of losses, they can only recognise this profit in their, um, in their accounting records once you have offset the losses beyond those which have taken the investment account to zero. So what I mean by this is, let's say our investment asset originally is $100. We then make a loss of $120. We take our investment asset to zero dollars because we know that we can only recognize, as, recognize our losses up until the point where the investment asset equals zero. Okay, so it'd be twenty dollars of loss we won't be recognizing. Let's say we then make a fifty dollar profit in the next year. What that means is there'll be that twenty dollar loss we haven't recognized, so we need to reduce our profit by that twenty dollars. Okay. And so then we can only increase our investment asset by the $30 because we have offset all unrecognized losses with our new profits. And then the amount that remains is the number that we can increase our investment asset by. So that's all for this video. I hope it was useful. And again, I apologize for the mistake in the previous video.